It's the 9th of March 2017 and it's Dan from Filmfest International. I'm joined by um, award-winning screenwriter Richard Lyons for, who um, won an award at our London Festival back in February. He's taken some time out from his day to have a conversation with us and talk about all film things, film and his work in the industry. So Richard, thank you so much for taking some time. It's uh, It's been a long time in coming, this interview. It's been something we've been looking to arrange and uh, we finally got round to it, so... Thank you very much for joining us. Yes, excellent. Uh, good to talk to you, Dan. Fantastic. So your script, um, Deirdre of Sorrows, picked up an award in London. If you could tell the listeners a little bit about that story, if they're not aware of it, and obviously why you chose to tell such a story. Uh, the story originally, I, I read the play version by John Millington Singh. Uh, he wrote a version of Deirdre. And she goes back to Irish mythology uh, from, you know, the, the deep birth of Ireland. She's Ireland's Helen of Troy, uh, oh. so to speak. She is the beauty that everybody seeks but can't attain or that is stolen from them. Um, it's not strictly based on Helen of Troy. It has its Irish uh, background, and it carries with it uh, all the characterizations of that. Now, John Millington Singh had fewer, fewer characters. Uh, I elaborated that a little bit. To take it from the play uh, to film uh, demands a very different treatment, and so I worked on that very hard. But from it, I think you glean, you know, a sense of the of the Irish and their uh, present day divisions going back throughout their history. Of course, obviously, it's making it authentic as well because. It's one of those things when you've got a story that's already been told in some way, you want to make it unique as you can. Obviously, was that your biggest struggle, would you say, in trying to adapt it um, from us? Because the stage show, wasn't it, Ad adapting it? Yes, correct. The, this, the stage play was very short and it was very abrupt. But what it did and what impressed me was that it, it wasn't something that I thought about. It was something that emotionally kicked me in the stomach. You know, oh, okay. the, <clears throat> the fate of this poor girl and uh, what occurred because of it. So I wanted to take that and lengthen it, making it make it something passionate, something you could think about, um, something transformative in your thinking yeah. uh, through her character. And so the whole point of the story is that, you know, every – Every good story is about love, and so it's a love story, and every true story is about death. Yeah, very um, true. So how do you achieve that? When you, and so what the whole point of the story revolves around is how do you love your homeland, and your homeland is your family as well. So how do you love your family? And so it goes into the ideal regarding that and the reality regarding that. That makes sense. And I mean, that, uh, a lot of people seem to get sort of immersed in everything but the family don't they looking for validation from people that they don't even know um in in modern day society it seems obviously when was it did you actually um pen your version of as it were was it something that's been in the pipeline for a while no i, I um, started it uh probably 18 months ago and finished it uh nine months ago or so right and um and in the midst, you know, there's a lot of other things I'm active in. So, um, but it came together pretty quickly once I had the structure of it set up. Okay, so was it a case of sitting down and just dedicating a little bit of time to it each day, or how did your process? Yes. Yeah. No. Yes, exactly. You have to have the the raw discipline to to wake up, get everything else in your life off your mind, and <laughs> go right to the point <laughs> no of course no absolutely i mean it's a dedication because you can't just i mean at our festivals we um i'm so i know you weren't fortunate enough to join us in london um so congratulations on the fact of your hard work paid off um on winning an award and there was a few script writers there and they do say they just like writing one script after another and that's what they their kind of job and what they look to do is but obviously i understand that you've got a very active um <laughs> day-to-day -day lifestyle with obviously all different bits you're doing and that so was this the first one that you'd 
written for a little while or is it a case if you do them one after the other as well? Well, I'm more a, a poet by nature. My my works are available on uh, lilia.com. That's L-Y-L-E-A dot com. Okay. I'm a poet by nature. Uh, I've won some awards at that. And I'm presently engaged in a book of essays. Oh, okay. So what's the uh, subject so this was the first. This was the first script, though it's rather like a book of dramas that I did that can be found on the website. It's the same sort of structure. Okay. So taking that as experience, I, I moved it over to screenwriting. And uh, I have four or five other things uh, that I want to do for the screen because I find it a very – it is the modern – artistic expression it is isn't it i mean that's the thing you're not going to say that theater and stage is going to disappear but the ability to tell a story um as a show or a documentary or a feature or something yeah. like that and it's quite apt as well with it being um it's national women's day yesterday where obviously now we're just having the conversation and such obviously a uh a female who's such a focal point of a story right and uh yeah utterly utterly critical center of the world yeah you know? so everything in the everything in this movie would be movie uh revolves around her and how they view her because she is you know women are the vessel of life so she is what life is and so how they deal with her so you we have a series of characters and i'll just go through a couple of them you have please do. you have a king connor and what he wants to do is own her power, right? And her father wants to do the same. Then uh, you have other persons such as Arden who want to possess her um, and just take her as as herself without thinking about where she fits in the world, right? Take him, take her to his cave, <laughs> and uh, have her all to himself there. Whereas Connor wants to use her as an underpinning for a throne. So everybody has a different view of how they want to use Deirdre, but no one really thinks about what's best for Deirdre. And now doing a bit of research in things, I read looked into it and is it was it uh, she married is it Naoes or how was, I don't know the pronunciation of it. Well I had to change all the some of the some of the uh, character names are very hard to pronounce. Such right, as, exactly. Um, Noise the, and Nao <laughs> The character, I mean, I, we'll get into the editorial process, but when I, when I sent the original script with original names to, an, to a script consultant slash editor, yep. she said, are you kidding? You can't, <laughs> nobody can pronounce them. No. Try, and, try and ask an actor how he's going to pronounce this. So we changed a lot of the names, uh, and uh, I think they came out better. So there was, for instance, uh, the, one of the lead male characters, his name was Annecy. Right. right. So I changed his name to another Irish name, which is Arden. Yes. Which is like ardent, you know, ardent in your, in your love for somebody. So that fit very well. And other, other names lend themselves. But that was one of the real difficulties is taking the time, you know, while you're biting your knuckle. Yeah. What other names do I have to find? Yeah, that's <laughs> the thing, looking and going, right, so Deirdre's <laughs> obviously fine and well enough. And then you're thinking, oh, this is, yeah. And as you say, it's a really difficult name and you want people to be able to relate to characters if it's coming from a exactly. script in a book to then go on a screen that's why i mean i'm baffled by the success of a game of thrones where people just will bring out characters names left right and center and i i can't even yeah, pro- can't it, even it, pronounce them i i think i think they just fit archetypes and so you understand the archetype not the name no i think you know that's, what i mean yeah no that makes sense so they, yeah they walk in and out and you say okay that guy is so and so in this yeah. archetypal story yeah whether it's a protagonist or yeah just obviously yeah. love interest or right exactly yeah just at all so do discuss with me then the process um of obviously the the editing it etc yeah the well um you want to start with the inside of the script and so the inside of the script is going to be your characterizations and how they develop the action which they go through and why and as you go through the story, of course, everything deepens. You you begin to understand who you're writing about. You know, you think you have a good characterization at the start, but as you're moving through the creative process, things add and things fall off, right? Yeah. So 
So you finally get to a point where, where you say, you know, I think I've got a complete script. Everything functions. Uh, we arrive at the, we have the beginning we want. We have the crises we want. We arrive at an end that is a good message. And then you send it to a script consultant. And I had a, an excellent one. Uh, that is, in, in terms of a writer, that's your editor. That's the person you send a finished product to, and then you think you've got a real good thing, and you send it to them. And the, the first thing you want to hear is, this has merits. And the second thing they're going to do is tell you to rip it to pieces. <laughs> so, so, so Richard, would you give advice to people? Obviously, again, um, for those listening that, that are script writers and that, if you I'm sorry, say again, Dan. just wanted to say like the advice that you would look to give to people listening in terms of finding the um, person that you're going to pass your script on to to check, what if you're very possessive of, of what you've written and you're not really up for criticism of it? Is it something you just need to accept that someone is going to be critical of your work and say to you, you need to shred it, you need to cut back on this? Um, I, I think it's always extremely valuable to have other sets of eyes looking at the same thing, because there are things to which um, it's rather like there's an old uh, parable of the elephant in India, yeah. and the 10 different persons are blindfolded and asked to describe the elephant. Yeah. They, they each go to a different part of the elephant and describe an entirely different thing. So one is describing the leg, the other the trunk, the other the ear. No one has a view of the whole elephant. Mm. But the more eyes you put on your work, and yeah, it's it's uh, it's humbling, but you need that. Uh, it's it's also it's going to tell you what persons who are objective will not understand. That's that what I was going to say to you. you yeah. Of course, that's what I was going to say to you. I mean, with the filmmakers I get to meet, people welcome criticism, but you do meet the odd few which they believe their work is the perfect finished article. So as you say, yes. meeting someone that actually can say to you, this, 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 and this, is actually they're acting as that voice for that audience, if you like, uh, the people. Yes, I, yeah. I'm firmly convinced that Da Vinci made many sketches of the Mona Lisa before he painted it. That's a fair point. Obviously, if they're lying around anywhere, then I wouldn't mind uh, tripping upon one because that'd be worth <laughs> a little bit, wouldn't it? <laughs> No, but everyone, I can't say enough that if, if you're a writer, you need to have another set of eyes looking at your work. And probably, you know, it's always nice to hear, hey, this is great. These are wonderful things. But the key to improving what you've done is not to hear that it's good, but to hear what you didn't do correctly and what needs to be improved. And that's the thing. If you can take that on board, obviously be appreciative to do it. Because, I mean, writing it's something that, Personally, my, my degree was in filmmaking, but what I actually do now, obviously, though I'm involved in the festivals, I like to write if it is, and I don't do anything with it because I'm someone that's scared of showing it to anyone else because I don't think it's of that level. Um, but it's always good if you were to do so for someone to say, that's good, but did you think about this? Um, right, and I think it's important to have someone who's at arm's length, not a friend. Yeah, because they're only you know going to say I mean? nice someone things you... to you. You deal strictly on a, in a business sense yeah. with the editor. You can appreciate um, what, what they have done in their career, and you can appreciate works that perhaps they've done, but do it in an entirely objective business uh, transaction. Yeah, rather than it being oh, on, yeah, on a personal level. Um, it just yeah, allows you to yeah, keep that distinguished, yeah. really, doesn't it, in distance, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's less painful, but there's still, and, and it's more work. I mean, you have to go back and uh, correct what's needing correcting. Whereas if you were to show it to a close um, sibling, partner, or friend, they probably would go, yeah, it's great, well done. And you go, well, I've done it, job done. Yeah, but got, right. Of course it's not. <laughs> How easy was that? <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> First draft and I nailed it. Yeah, right. <laughs> so with you, is writing linear in terms of beginning, middle and end? Or would you go, I've got the ending, I know how I want the conclusion to be, I'm now going to go and write the start and then the middle will fill itself. Is that a part of your process? Um, I, I think um, it's it's more in the nature of a, 
of a DNA helix where you have you have you have message which is one strand of the helix you have characters or another uh, and you have uh, events and so they intertwine and move you know like in in a winding way so they all begin in one place and they all end well no they don't begin in the same place but they all end in the same place yeah so um, and and the critical the critical part of the creation is maintaining the ties where you're not leaving anything out and that's one I of the things where and obviously you you saying that to me richard has reminded me of films like uh, magnolia or crash where oscar winning uh, films where they've had so many different strands yeah, but, they're, but they're all relevant to the narrative because then when it comes to the conclusion and the end you look and go oh yeah it was all relevant and it all comes together and stories told in such a way i find are fascinating because it shows such skill yeah you, you can look at it as a dna helix or a hub and spoke right sort okay of arrangement they're new terms to me actually um to obviously so is that yeah. something which is common for writers to the dna helix is that me being naive or? oh no that i'm sorry i just made that up actually oh <laughs> how I, it's how i look at it yeah because you're starting you're, you're starting with the basics of the script, so the characters, and you want to start with what what are you trying to say? So you have to invest in the characters' impediments for them to realize what you're trying to say. You put roadblocks in front of them, and then their actions and their thoughts yep. and how they interact with other characters form the strands that revolve through the story. So would you say that... Evolve. The first thing is looking at the telling a story of life, love and death is the main bit. And then you go, right, now I've got to find out what characters I want to use in order to tell this. Is that the first bit is looking at the genre? Yeah, you have to. I, I, I think you have to start with a problem. Yeah. And then you have to invest characters with that problem that they have to overcome. And different characters use different ways to overcome the same problem. And they also interact with each other, commenting on the different ways that they're they're trying to deal with the problem. Yeah, of course. I mean, you then look so, at... So you're defining the problem and overcoming it through crises. And I guess that is kind of the model which is used time and time again, isn't it? Whether or not it's then the underdog coming out on top. Um, yeah. I mean, would you look to say that you use similar characters when you present them with the same, um, if I can ask this question the right way, similar characters with similar traits in different stories when you place them with the same problem that they've got to identify if it's um, conflict and you think, oh, I like covering conflict with this sort of character. Um, no, because each, each character has to be very distinct. And so, you know, I, I, I don't like template characters. Right, okay. So you can, go, you can go to books and find template characters, and there are that. Um, if you go back to the Iliad, I mean, there's a lot of template characters there. There's Odysseus, who is, you know, the wise cracker, and, you know, he, he prefers to work through craft. You have Agamemnon, who's arrogant. You've got uh, Helen, who's vain. You have Andromache, who's, who's a domestic honorable woman. Um, there are these archetypes, of course, but you really have to make it distinctive in order to make it your script. Yeah, no, that makes I sense. Think. No, no, I, yeah. I agree, because obviously you don't want to just be copying them. I mean, so obviously so many films seem to have, and actors have made their entire careers out of the same yes. narrative. If it's the uh, Stevens, obviously not want to <laughs> name drop in, in, well, in such conversation, but Steven Seagal and Jean-Claude Van Damme and these actors that just churn through the same character, the same narrative, give it a different title, yep. and it works. However, that's not for everyone's cinema or a creative style, is it? You want to obviously generate something well, new here, and fresh. Here's a, fun, here's a funny thing I've observed. If you look at all the big grossing movies nowadays, uh, all the Marvel character movies, mm -hmm. That's going right back to the Iliad again because you're talking about mortals with superhuman powers rather than gods coming down and mixing in with men to determine the outcome of battles. I mean, you're always, it's always superhuman character. 
Yeah, whether uh, whether an everyday they went person. For the technology. Huh? Whether an everyday, obviously, whether or not it's your Iron Man or yeah, the everyday person that's then say they're not of God-like status. They've just been. Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting. Um, obviously, if you're looking at Marvel and they're created from Stan Lee, do you think that then he drew inspiration from the Iliad? Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, it uh, it goes back to the Iliad in the marriage between men and gods. So you have uh, superhumans like Achilles, yep, and that sort of thing, and and uh, so you you infuse gods with the traits of mortals and mortals with the traits of gods, and and it's it really works these days because of the technology, because uh, with technology you can do anything in film. Yeah, of course. So yeah, the the way it's developed from the the Jason and the Argonauts with the plasticine right. dinosaurs exactly. and dragons to now how it's developed. So yes. with the scripts obviously developing it, what was the biggest challenge you would say that you had? Um, and if you could, obviously again, because now you've done it and obviously you had a guidance with what to change, but what would you change now if you could change anything? So challenges and changes. Um, well, uh, the great challenge is, is that every character has to go through a process of learning something. And they all have to, and this has to be an overcoming of an inner weakness. And I think I, I, think I achieved that. Uh, you have to get to a point where you know, I could keep sending this thing back to other consultants or editors, or I can keep tweaking it, but there has to come a point at which you say, you know, this script is done. And you have to push it down to the other end of your desk and say, I'm, I'm not going to do any more work because to get to the next um, stage of the discussion, the reason you would want to take something like this and turn it into a film uh, is because for any film to exist, the screenplay has to die. This so you, yeah, you have to take the screenplay to a producer and director. What is the first thing they're going to do? They're going to shred it. They're going to want to make it theirs. <laughs> yeah, they're going to obviously... They and, want to put their name in it. And the main thing that you often see is on a film credits, adapted from the screenplay by... But, yeah, right. And, yeah, uh, writers, are, writers are given fairly short shrift in, in, uh, in uh, film production. But what, what it also adds... So, so you have a, a script that is your own creation, and it's bounced off a couple of consultants... But then if you get it into production, then you're adding the talents and insights of producers, directors, other writers. Uh, then you have cinematographers who are going to take care of the whole look of the film. Yeah. The director's going to have his own views on the action. Uh, your, your costuming and your set design, production design is going to give it another aspect of life. So you're turning what was a stem, which is yours, into something like the petals of a flower gather around it and each is distinct and so you're multiplying the life uh, that you thought you created yes. so you have to again you have to be humble yes. and you have to let it go <laughs> so that's what I find that was obviously uh, though I mentioned about things you would change but I come with another question people are often very possessive and as you're saying you need to be humble and appreciate that others in order to make the transition from script to screen um, and right. is that your mentality or would it be a case of if someone said right we're going to look to make Deirdre of Sorrows into a production um, but we are taking it over and you are to have no involvement but you'll get your paycheck as it were would you be happy with that or would you want an involvement to make sure that what you wrote was um, filmed and obviously hits post-production and hits the screens in the way that you intended well, I, I would intend to, you have to, another aspect of creating anything is you need to defend it. So you do want to be humble and you do want to listen to ideas that are additional, mm -hmm. but you also do not want to uh, have the work discredited or lessened. So, uh, yeah, be humble. Yeah, listen. But you, I think uh, from my point of view, I would come along with a production uh with some input, yes. That makes sense too. I mean, some people that um, script writers that I've met have said that all they would like to do is write a script, sell it, and get some, go yeah. on to the next one, sell it. I mean, 
Yeah. Do you do you appreciate that approach to being creative writer, like a creative writer? No, yeah, I think it would depend on the kind of script. I mean, I I couldn't write like that, but um, there are scripts that are very good that make a point that, uh, and they churn them out like uh, like sausages. But uh, and you know, there's something to be said for making money. I I've never been good at that because <laughs> I, <laughs> I I write things to be read and and people don't read nowadays. <laughs> well. well. There are... well, I was hoping actually I was hoping actually to make a few bucks at this, you know, get some credits up and, and uh, move on from there. Well, that's the thing It is when you're creative, you're often not the entrepreneur or haven't got obviously that mentality or mindset where people can look at it. Um, so yep. what are your plans then um, with Deirdre of Sorrows? Have you looking to reach out at, to at another? present? It is going through you. You. You want to take on, uh, in addition, when you when you get a script consultant uh, who will go over your ideas and and rip them up, and you have to reconstruct it. Then on the other end, you have to have someone with a marketing idea mm -hmm. of where this script can go. Who would appreciate it, right? The first thing I did was put it on the festival circuit, and I was greatly honored by by your festival uh, with the award. So you want to build up some good critique. Other, what it says is other people are reading this and they're saying it's worthy of being read when you earn these accolades. Uh, then you want a script consultant of a kind that deals with the marketplace. And so what I had them do is construct a list. I think we're up to, I think it's just 45 different studios producers who uh, this consultant thinks would very much appreciate and have the ability to produce this style of script. So you get the contact names and so forth. Then you get an agent to represent uh, the script and to defend it. They have to. Their mission is to defend the copyright. That's invaluable advice, to be honest. Because, I mean, for for those listening, that's something which is really useful to understand. Because I know there are people which write scripts and don't know what to do with it next, and wouldn't even have an idea that those were the steps. So maybe that could be a way of making income. The uh, the Richard yeah. Lyons sim you, simple you steps. Film, you could also yeah, you you know, there's a lot of work around film that people don't realize. Um, but if you have a script, for instance, and, and uh, you think it's great and other people think it's great and you start shopping it around and just sending it to anybody, uh, it could be produced in China. Yep. And that, <laughs> yep. That's in a month or two, because they people will clip these things and uh, make them their own. So you have to you have to get copyrights and protections as well. That's obviously one of the important things, which a lot of people, again, if you're a creative brain but not a business brain, you don't appreciate the um, legalities of it. And you could go, right. I want to share my idea with as many people as I can. And then all of a sudden, you see it comes onto the TV. or Yeah, and you're, oops. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it's to have that happen must be devastating. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, cop copyright's an important aspect. So when you've finished what you've done... Uh, you know, talk to an attorney and get a copyright on it. Of course. Um, no matter what the cost, or would you say you need to be? No, you know, it do, it's, it doesn't come at great cost. You just you want your storyline and your characters to be secure, recognized as this is the title of the work and it's a body of work. And if it's in if it's on file in an attorney's office, it probably costs you about five hundred bucks. It's on file; they have it, and it's protected. Right. Again, that's something which is useful. Um, so anyone listening that is a scriptwriter, um, take the advice because I think it's certainly something valuable to, uh, <laughs> to take on board. <laughs> so to go back to an earlier question, would you change anything? Yes. Um, at this point, no, because I think if, if you enter in a, into a collaboration, as it was with an editor, you're going to hear from a prospective director. You know, this is where I would take the character at this point. This is where I would change the message. This is where the action should go in this direction. Right. You're going to hear that. It's inevitable. Uh, that's when you would change further. That's when you would adapt uh, further. Because at a certain, I could, I could rework this thing for another year. 
Of course you could. And just you like fine tuning things. Yeah. But I, you know, there's, I want to get on to other things and, and I think it's a worthy, pro- a very worthy property right where it is. And if someone else has suggestions, then that, that's not only going to help uh, me see a new channel for it, but also it'll help through the production process. No, I think that's a f- one idea fair point. always multiplies, you know, through when you're sitting in a room in, with a, with a, you know, having a production meeting and a director has one idea, the producer is going to talk about the new idea. Then somebody in cinematography is going to say, you know, that would change the whole look. So I have to think in these terms. So uh, you want to get this to that stage. There's a point at which you have to shut the screenplay down. Of course, and if you're just sat in a room on your own um, with your project, which you've taken from a blank screen to many, many a uh, page of text, then you are going to sit there and you could, as you say, fine tune it, fine tune it, and then all of a sudden, it's so well sort of tweaked that there's no room for others to come in perhaps and actually change it because they're not going to have seen what was there before which could be manipulated and tweaked in other directions yeah, and another another hazard to that is that you get away from your original idea yes the more you tweak it the more you carry it away from the original thought so that's a hazard too so at this stage you know you, you with any work of this kind I mean, I've written books that I can go back and say, you know, man, I, there was a problem on page 89. I, I should correct that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but at a point, you got to close the cover and say, that's it. And that's the kid, and that's the way they are. Yeah, and that's obviously the way you need to do it. So yeah. your interest, obviously, in the film then, um, so you just want to finish on this then. So are you going to be looking to find something else? I mean, it, is it mainstream cinema that you enjoy or what's your love of the industry? What's your favorite sort of films to watch? Well, I think, I, I think mainstream theater is now gone, you know, like we talked about to these epic structure structures and, you know, a lot of computer animation and things like that. Mm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put my interest there. I'd put it more in period pieces such as Deirdre of the Sorrows is yes, that have, you know, an avenue to deep, characterization and, and uh, deep messaging. Um, and I, I think these movies still exist, and I like them. I want to get into uh, sci-fi uh, oh, okay. soon. And uh, I, have a, I have a good movie in mind that will be my next screenplay that is uh, mafia-oriented, but then I want to get into sci-fi because I want to take advantage of these uh, computer generation uh, abilities in sci-fi. Obviously, yeah, and the there's a CGI is incredible. Storytelling, huh? The CGI is incredible, and obviously, sometimes that can take away from the narrative. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas, I think, again, I've seen, having studied film, having been involved in these festivals, I've seen films from all around the world, shorts and do- my favourite type of film um, is a documentary, just because it can, a story can be told in so many different ways. But actually, I personally, I'm not, a, I'm not a big fan of sci-fi. Um, because I don't like the, I know it allows you to escape reality, but the use of CGI, I like a gritty yeah. story or a period um, piece where it is obviously got a bit of authenticity and age into it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, in a way sci-fi has been what they call done to death. Yeah. The, uh, with regard to storylines. But I have some I have some ideas along that line. But this... Um, to go back to Deirdre of the Sorrows, if if this is taken up by a production company or, or studio, yes, uh, there's a there's a possible triplet to this. I mean, there could be three scripts generated out of it. Oh, following on from the the same narrative, yeah. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. So that would keep me busy for a bit, and then I'd I'd move on. <laughs> and I, and say the next idea is always there. It's just having the time to um make it a reality i guess that goes back dan to that you know you got to wake up in the morning get everything else out of your head and do what's in front of you <laughs> it's easier said than done though because i mean that's right <laughs> the ability you me this morning <laughs> <laughs> i've got a colleague um he's in the office with me at the moment and he'll, he'll have 20 jobs to do at the start of the day and he'll finish the day with an extra 10 on top of that and he would have done none of them because it's so right. easy to be distracted and do other things as you say if you sit down and go i've this is what i need to do um but sometimes it's not for your own fault 
It's just through the lifestyles. And obviously, I'm sure if you were to sit there and go, this is my next project, this is what I'm going to do, lock me in a room, I'm going to get it finished, then I'm sure you'll make it happen. Yeah, that's that's the idea. And yeah, the world is very distracting nowadays. Yeah, so, so social media and obviously everything on there. Um, everything. I found this to be very fascinating. Obviously, as I said to you, it was something whereby I know different hindrances had um, put this interview off from taking place. But I actually think that what you've discussed and the inf- it's been very informative, not only for myself, obviously, listening in, but other listeners as well, which we often get. Script writers in attendance to our festival are in the minority because obviously you've got a lot of filmmakers and actors and actresses. And I often get asked questions yeah. of how I could give advice or do I know any advice for the next steps and half an hour ago the answer was limited information I feel that you've kind of actually given me some information now which I can pass on to budding scriptwriters so they know where to actually take their project um, to the next step so that's really appreciated oh great I, I appreciate having been part of the festival no, um, and your trophy is to be on its way to you, as is a copy of um, Film the Magazine, which I know you've um, got a fantastic... I mean, the artwork to accompany the script um, was beautiful as well. Um, it was in Yeah, art. That, illustrator, that illustrator, Robert Venables, he lives on the Isle of Wight. Oh, really? Okay. He's, just south, he's just south of you. Just <laughs> south, yeah, not too far away at all. Um, right. Again, anyone listening that wants to have a look at that, it's in our London issue of Film the Magazine, which is on our website, so you can have a look at that. Um, But thank you so much for your time, Richard. Um, It's been greatly appreciated, and if there's any further developments of scripts, then we'd love to see them um, and maybe have you join us in one of our wonderful cities. Will do, and thank you very much, Dan. You're more than welcome. Thank you very much, Richard. Take care. So that was me having a conversation with award-winning scriptwriter Richard Lyons. He uh, took some time out of his day, as I said, and I think you'd agree it's quite a fan, uh, fascinating conversation to have. Um, we often speak with filmmakers and go through the casting and editing um, process of filmmaking, but being a scriptwriter, Richard was able to give us an insight into developing a project, the characters, the narrative arc, and also the copyright side of things as well. So... Certainly I've learned something new today and I hope you guys have as well. So join us again next time when we'll be um, interviewing another expert as it were, or an expert or filmmaker in the industry and uh, find out what they've got to say about the projects that they've been working on. Thanks very much and take care.